All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I'm going to wait probably just a minute and then we're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> All good. Enjoy that lunch. <laughs> Okay, I'll go ahead and get us started. And then as more people join, I will let them in. So welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. As most of you know, I am Sherelle Bethel, um, the Project Director for Project Power. So today's webinar is called Promoting Access and Inclusion in Instruction and Training with Universal Design for Learning. And it's being presented by Sharon Stevens. Um, closed captioning is available if you need it, and I'm going to introduce Sharon. So Sharon Steven advocates, Stevens advocates for accessible learning environments and believes we should change the environment, not the learner. She believes this change starts by creating awareness of our biases and preferences and accounting for learner variability in the design of instruction. With over 30 years of experience, Sharon has worked with corporations, the military, and higher education institutions. She received her master's degree in, edu from, in education from George Washington University, and in 1998, Sharon joined the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs and served as the faculty development coordinator in the Faculty Resource Center. She worked closely with faculty to integrate universal design for learning principles in courses and received grants to support the development and implementation of the faculty development program, Universal Design for Inclusive, inclusive Teaching. In addition, Sharon served, Sarah, Sharon served on the Campus Digital Accessibility Committee, the Instructional Accessibility Subcommittee, and the Teaching and Learning Conference. Sharon is well aware of the Parent Center's mission and the support they provide, as she was one of Peak Parent Center's families. Um, recently retired, Sharon plans to dedicate her time as an advocate for accessible environments for all learners. So without further ado, Sharon, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate that introduction. You know, I wanted to start out by um, saying how appreciative I am of the Parent Center's mission and the services that they offer. And as Cheryl was mentioning that, you know, I was one of your families. And I can say that um, it was about eight or 10 years ago, I was at the point of frustration. <laughs> And um, I Googled, and I don't know what I Googled, but the top thing that came up was um, peak parent. And I can tell you that not only changed my family's life by reaching out to peak parent, but also changed my professional um, and how I define what was important for faculty and the best practices that they should be integrating into their teaching. So it was life-changing, not only for my family, but also for me as a professional. So, you know, pat yourselves on the back. It's a, a great, great mission. It's a great center and you offer wonderful resources to um, your, your clients and your families. So what I'd like to do today is to go ahead and set some kind of ground, some ideas on how we might, um, how you will be able to access information, but also how we might engage together. Um, I'm noticing we have about six participants at, at the at the moment. So that's a it's a good group. We can do a lot of uh, interacting, and a little and a lot of interactions can happen. So the first um, way you can access information is by participating in this dialogue today, and in a few minutes I'll show 
about tell you about how you can do that. You also can um, get more information. Um, if you notice on the screen on the upper right hand corner, um, you, there is a QR code and you can simply use if you have your phone available to you, go ahead and turn on your camera, you can put it up to that image and this one in particular will open up that Google Doc um, that's available and that is shared with you. You can also um, receive that information, the workbook information. Um, Sherelle sent that out by email, but you can also access it um, through this URL, 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 QR code. <laughs> So um, the other thing is that there are a lot of resources in the e-workbook. There's a lot of def definitions that are, that are defined, as well as additional resources. So if, as we go through this presentation today and you say, oh, I, I know this, I know this, and you want to click on that QR code or go out to that website and access additional information, you know, feel free to do that. So how to engage today? Well, I'm going to say um, if you feel comfortable feel free to keep your video on. Um, if you're um, eating lunch or you know you, you don't feel as comfortable having that video on, there's nothing wrong with turning it off. Um, so we can have video on and video off and still engage in, in a dialogue with each other. But I will ask is, um, and I notice you're, you're, perfect, you're uh, professionals at this because you're, uh, you already have muted um, your audio. And the only reason we're going to do this is that when you're not speaking, have that muted because that will allow us to reduce background noises that might, might happen. And also, um, so you can use your audio. Um, you can raise your hand. I am happy to call on you. If I miss that hand raise, Sherelle is going to be there to help me help me out and keep me on target. Um, and, or you, if there's a pause in the presentation and you simply want to um, go ahead and speak out, that is fine today too. Um, perhaps you're not so into the, you know, engaging um, using the audio. You can use chat. A lot of great things happen in a chat room during sessions, as you know. So you can have conversations there you can ask your questions and um and we can and i have have that chat box up so i'll be able to kind of um, monitor and facilitate that as well and if audio and chat is not your thing and you want to just do some reactions that works too thumbs up thumbs down happy smiles <laughs> kind of um, relaying how, how you're feeling about about the particular content so what I'd like to do is I know you know each other, you've worked together, <laughs> but if you could, um, if you feel comfortable today, if you could introduce yourself to me and maybe a little bit about um, your knowledge in universal design for learning principles and what a learning goal that you have um, for, for today's session. And we're gonna define the learning goal is, as a um, desired achievement that you would like to achieve as a result of being in this session today. So if you want to type in the chat, you can feel free to do that. You can also just, I'm going to pause here in a minute, and you can just speak out, introduce yourselves. We do have a small group, so it should um, make it pretty easy to navigate. If you don't want to share with me, that's fine as well. Um, there is in the e-workbook on page two, I have a personal learning goal activity that you can participate in as well. So anyone want to go first? <laughs> I will. <laughs> Always shy. <laughs> I'm Angela Lindig. I'm the executive director of Idaho Parents Unlimited. Um, I guess I, I'm pretty, I'm very familiar with UDL. Um, however, my, I guess my learning goal for today is how we, um, how we best convey this kind of information for, to families okay. um, and how they can then use it in they're in a practical sense. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go. So this is Sherelle again from Peak. Sharon, I've shared a little bit with you, but again, I'm familiar with the concept. Uh, I've not done much actual training. So this is something that I'll be taking in completely. And we do have a small group. So it's just Peak Parent Center and Idaho staff here today. So thanks. Okay, Any, anyone else want to introduce themselves before we move on to the next slide? 
I'll just um, tag on to Angela. My name's Ann Wilson, and I'm at Peak Parent Center as well. Um, and I'm pretty familiar with UDL, but um, kind of along the lines of what Angela said, just um, because sometimes I'm in a lot of situations where I wish people were using UDL, but they're not, but I'm not um, in charge or anything. And so I'm kind of thinking in the same way, like how, how, how we can support families and youth using it. Okay. And I'm Quinna. Um, I'm at Peak Parent Center as well. Um, I am newer to UDL, so just hoping to gain a deeper understanding with this training. Okay. Thank you. And then we had Allison in the chat. She says she's having some audio issues, but she's Allison from Idaho yeah. Parents yeah. Limited. Okay. Welcome, yeah. Allison. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I think we got everybody. So I appreciate your introductions and kind of telling me a little bit about your goals. I think um, the one thing that you're going to, that's really interesting is, um, and I think you, when you provide your training, it's the same way you have a really diverse group um, you have, and we're going to talk a lot about that a, a little later in terms of how, how can you engage um, a diverse group in, in a uh, training session. But I appreciate um, the feedback I received on the survey that was sent out. Um, I think it was about a month ago. Um, I really did gain a lot of information from that. And I appreciate the uh, time that you, you took to do that. What I found was that um, everyone who participated in the survey said that they had heard of UDL, but they hadn't implemented in training. So um, having your goals here, I now know that two of you today actually are using UDL. So um, this, this is good information to have. But what I thought I would do based upon that information from the survey is I'm gonna just really start out by defining some of those key concepts of universal design. Um, how that relates to accessibility. And then we'll move into to kind of describing um, UDL and those diverse learners. So um, I guess to, and part of the survey results, you mentioned you were interested in multiple means of engagement, but you were also interested in um, how to format um, handouts to be more accessible. So I uh, put some emphasis on that in today's workshop. In today's workshop, and then I'd like to have an, the time in the end for you to actually kind of um, use a concept of UDL. So it's really great we have some people out there that are currently using that and how you could integrate that into a training practice. And then we'll articulate some next steps um, as far as um, integrating that. I will do my best. I know that we had two people that mentioned about how families can use this. Um, and so I will think of, consider that and think about that and how I can also incorporate um, that, that goal into the this uh, current training structure. So just getting started, I want to um, really provide some key concepts um, around um, universal design for learning. And um, what you see here on the slide is a definition for accessibility on the left and a definition for universal design on the right. And in the center, I have two graphics. Um, one, I know this is a graphic that you have seen many times. It's part of your day-to-day -day, uh, interactions that um, and how to provide accommodations for student for um, families, and then also how do we create these accessible environments. So I just want to start um, there and then how that applies to universal design. So when we talk about those accommodations, as you know, we're really talking about um, providing um, that short person with that stepping stool. Um, we can see in this image that that middle person does not need any accommodations to be able to access this um, whiteboard. And then the person on the right um, who uh, uses a wheelchair needs that ramp and a platform to be able to access that whiteboard. When we talk about accessibility, what we're really talking about is um, how we can change that environment. How can we make that whiteboard uh, larger, lower to the ground, so that all users, all learners can access that whiteboard. And so when we talk about accessibility today, um, how I was defining it, and I would try to broaden this based upon what you said in your for your learning goals, but the accessibility being the degree to which your training materials and the learning environment can be effectively used by all your learners. And you can do that by applying um, the principles of uh, universal design. And universal design is that proactive, proactively designing a learning experience, considering those um, variables and reducing those barriers. So 
let's dive just a little deeper into the uh, universal design for learning and talk about those three principles. So we all know that learners are different. And when we provide instruction, our, one of our goals is to provide a learning environment that can be accessed and accessible by all students. And so the Universal Design for Learning has three main principles, uh, representation, engagement, and action and expression. And in doing and applying these three principles, we should be able to create or at least reduce some of that variability and those barriers um, to, to learning. Um, if um, there is a QR code up on the right, up on the upper right, this will take you to a website. Um, this will take you to CAST, who is actually the, um, the, the, the it is actually their, their model that they uh, created years ago. And there's a lot of additional information. You will notice that there is a matrix, that there's a lot of different levels to universal design. My um, goal today is to present this in, uh, in a way that you could take this back and start applying it to your training materials. So representation will be about how can you present information, the same information in multiple ways. We'll talk about engagement and how you can provide multiple ways to engage and interact with learners. And then we'll also provide how you can provide multiple methods for your um, learners, your families to communicate and to demonstrate their understanding and, and their learning. So this is the um, kind of the really in the nutshell what learn universal design is all about. So when you go out to that website and you see the multiple layers and all the, the, the huge checklist, um, I just really caution you to kind of um, think about this, that you're going to start and pick one area that you really would like to focus on because I think um, it can be overwhelming. There's a lot there. <laughs> There's a lot of things that they, they are offering and suggesting that um, needs to be accessible, but I just say choose one, choose one and work on that and then and move to the other. So um, with that, what I also want to talk about, and I wasn't going to do this, but I think it just really, um, when I started looking at this, it's the goal of universal design for learning is that um, by integrating and creating these multiple ways for you are really are creating an expert learner. But I think this is really a mission of, of um, the, the parent centers is that you are providing um, information and resources to your families so that your families are able to be very um, resource, resourceful and knowledgeable in their abilities to um, interact and advocate for themselves. You, are, you want them to be motivated and purposeful in how they engage and very strategic and goal-directed. So I saw a lot of commonality between what universal design for learning principles are trying to do and what you and the um, parent centers. And so I wanted to go ahead and put that in here. So there is this, you. Um, um, QR code will take you out to um, a website that also provides additional information. There's text there. You can also read that um, text through audio. And there's also videos that um, describe a little bit more about what that expert learner is. Okay, so what I'd like to do here in the last couple minutes, I provided a lot of information about the key concepts that are going to really be built upon today. So I just want to recap cap that. I want to give you the opportunity to ask your questions. I want you to give the give you the opportunity to kind of reflect on that. So let me give a summary on this. So we can recognize that all learners are different. And then when we provide training and instruction, what we really are trying to do is to create an accessible learning environment for all learners, for all our participants. And universal design for learning, um, the three principles, multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement, and by using multiple means of action and expression, we can create a learning environment that really creates an expert learner, a learner that is knowledgeable, motivated, and purpose and strategic and goal directed. There's also in the e-workbook on page four, a progress chart activity. If you wanna kind of keep tabs, write notes um, on, on that, you can do that as well. At this point, are there any questions about those key concepts that we're going to be diving deeper into today?
Okay. Okay. And if something comes up, it doesn't something doesn't make sense, you know, go ahead, type it in the chat, you know, raise your hand, and we can definitely come back and revisit that as well. So I'm going to give you um, an opportunity to engage in a strategy that um, you would like to explore first. So we have three strategies, universal design for learning strategies that we are going to be discussing today. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to choose the sequence. And so, and I'm going to demonstrate how you can do this using the chat. And then later in this presentation, we're gonna use a polling app to show you how you can also use a polling app. If you have a small number, so we have about nine people typing this in the chat, it just is one less add-on and can really um, works well. But if you have a, a group of 50 to 100 people in your presentation, having them type options in the chat is probably not the thing to do. So if you would like to explore engagement first, um, go ahead and type one in the chat. If you would like to explore representation first, go ahead and type two. And if you would prefer action and expression, go ahead and type three. Okay, we got threes. Okay, one, two, got another three. Oh, lots of threes. Okay, I'm gonna call that three is the winner. <laughs> And we are going to um, go ahead and explore the action and expression first, and then we'll come back and do the other, other two. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on action and expression. So what I'm going to do, the format here today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you two ideas on what you can do. And then I'm gonna open it up because we have, um, you have ideas, we have people in the audience today that are already integrating this. So um, it'd be good to hear kind of how they're doing it in, in their parent training. So um, I'm gonna give you two ideas and then I'm gonna ask for you to um, share your ideas. So one of the first things in action and expression, we're talking about um, providing multiple means for learners to be able to um, communicate and express their knowledge to express that um, to express their learning, and so one of the first things you can do is to really create different types of activities. So um, within a presentation, can you um, have application at the end of this presentation? You will be applying it to a training practice. Um, can through that application, can they give? Um, can they give a presentation on what they know? Can they take a quiz? Um, using Google Forms makes it pretty, relatively easy to create a you know, self-monitoring quiz that your presenter, your, your audience can do. Or um, polling, if you want to make it really live and you're doing a webinar to go ahead and have them um, poll and have it displayed live on what people understand and what they don't know. So these are all different types of activities that you can engage, that you can, that your learners can, um, your families can express um, how they know um, and how they can monitor their own learning. Also individual um, versus group. We have some um, learners that are really just interested in um, working alone. Um, articulating and reflecting and being very introspective on how they learn. And others are going to learn better in groups. And then you're going to find some that, um, that you know, some sort of um, hybrid of the two works best for them. So really considering the types of activities that you integrate into your training um, is really um, a, a, a good way to allow your learners to be able to communicate um, and express um, their, 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 their learning. The other um, thing is choices in, in the expression. So you have this activity and um, allowing different choices and how they express that learning, whether that be through the use of audio, um, whether that be a, a visual representation, an infographic, or um, if it's a written written 
thinking. So giving them choices and how they feel that they um, can express their knowledge best. And I'll give an example. I taught an instructional design course. And I will say when I first started teaching it, I really felt this was a graduate course. These students, they really needed to be um, expressing their knowledge in writing. And it should be a very formal report because, you know, they are grad students. Well, what I found was some of those grad students were just really great at articulating their ideas and writing. Well, at the end of that class, I also had them give a capstone presentation. And what I realized um, very early on is that some of them just were articulate, who weren't very good at putting their ideas um, together in writing, were really good at articulating those ideas through um, presentations. So after I taught that class for the first time, I started to integrate that they could use, I mean, instructional designers, they need to be able to express their ideas in a written form. They need to be able to express their ideas um, through presentation and also kind of graphically and, and visually. And so I gave them the choice to be able to um, choose which one worked work best for them. So the more that you can integrate how they express their, their your, integrate these different types of activities, how they can ex express their, their knowledge, express their learning, um, is going to really enhance the that that um, activity. And then finally, um, the options for supporting different tools and assistive technologies. So let's say that um, you know webinars are the way that you give present that you give um, your um, your training, or maybe um, th there is a requirement for you know that uh, that that they need to express something in writing. So providing different supports so that they are able to um, express and articulate their ideas in written form. So that might be grammarly, that might be speech to text, um, that, that might be um, some more of the, the dictionary kinds of um, resources to define key terms. So there's ways to integrate those assistive technologies and offer choices when we're a little bit more limited in the type of activity and the choices of expression. Okay, so the final part, the um, or the second idea I'll give to you in terms of um, action and expression is to provide feedback in different formats. And this here can be, um, I have a few examples here. The first one is that you could, we talked about this on the other slide as well, is can you do self-monitoring quizzes? So as you're giving a presentation, um, incorporate those polling, or can you create a form where they can go back and revisit and articulate some of those ideas? Um, they don't necessarily have to be, or ha you know, have a grade assigned to them. They can just be used as a tool that they can kind of sense where they're at or where, where they want to be. Those progress checks, we have multiple examples out in that e-workbook on how you can integrate these. These can be as simple as a chart, uh, you know, a chart with I'm getting it, I don't quite have it, I need a little bit more information um, to actually um, what they call KWL kind of charts. So I encourage you to go out um, if you don't have that up already to explore some of those different options on how you can integrate those progress checks. And then just even after a presentation, presenting your ideas to um, go ahead and add a capstone activity. Like today, we're going to take these concepts that were being introduced and we're going to go ahead and integrate that into a um, some sort of activity where you can apply it today. You can get your questions answered today. And then the final piece, and I think this really works extremely well, especially when you're, you're doing training and you're having multiple audiences, is to hand out an exit ticket. So before they leave their training, if they would, and you can do this using Google Forms, to, to go ahead and um, ask them to, to answer just a few questions. One, you can ask them what you learned, what was your, your big takeaway? You can ask them, what would you have liked to have a little bit more information about? And then would you like a follow-up? Uh, and they can put in their preferred name. They can put in their preferred means of communication. You can contact me through um, phone or emails best, or so they get to per, they can kind of decide how they want you to get back in touch with them. Today, your exit ticket Ticket only gives the email because <laughs> I figured we all have been communicating through email, so that worked. But you know, when you're talking to your families, then providing those multiple options um, probably is a, a better a better fit. 
So, okay, so this is the third slide where it'd be um, really great to hear some of your ideas on how perhaps you are currently providing your learners, your families that um, options to how so that they can express and communicate their knowledge and what they know to you. Um, or if, you know, is there an idea that was presented here today that really kind of rang a bell that says, oh, I could really do this into my training. So if you would like to share, that would be great. I'm going to pause here in just a few minutes. Um, you can speak out like we did the introductions that worked really well. Or I'm going to, I'll have the, I do have that chat up and you can go ahead and put your ideas there. And we are watching that as well. Um, or if you want to go to your e-workbook, um, there is not only a progress check there, but there is also a checklist with other ideas um, that you can explore on how to implement action and expression. So I'm going to pause there and um, give you an opportunity to speak. I don't know if this is specifically this area, but I'm just thinking about a survey from for uh, another committee that I'm on that we sent out, um, and we've only sent it out in one way. So it's you know through SurveyMonkey, but there's no like alternative ways to see the survey. So how would you <laughs> like? How, do we add audio to that so that the questions could be? read out to them do we like do we is there like how what are the other ways or avenues to to do that so that it is accessible to more people yeah I mean, that's a really good question um surveys are a great great way to get to know your learners as well as um kind of figure out kind of how they can express their their knowledge and their resources um you know i i don't know much about survey monkey but I do know that um, when I've been a Microsoft Office person <laughs> most of my career, um, I'm now transitioning to Google. Um, I, and I, so I'm a little bit familiar with the Google, but Microsoft integrated, automatically integrated that audio version into the survey. So I would write a survey in text and it would automatically, if I had it, that option checked, it would automatically um, create an audio for that. So I do not know SurveyMonkey. <laughs> and if someone does in this audience, please speak up. But um, the things that I strongly encourage is that when you pick a tool, if you have the ability to choose a tool, to read their accessibility policy. And it, that, that was something I did with faculty a lot is, okay, so do you wanna use this tool? What assess, what's our accessibility policy? How, who's it accessible to? So I'm assuming SurveyMonkey is pretty big. I, I would be surprised if there wasn't something there built in or an add-on that would allow that audio. Um, you know, how do, how do you incorporate that <laughs> into it, you know, because it's an external tool. I don't know that there is an easy way if they don't offer that as a choice. Um, I mean, I guess what you could do if some, if you had a, a family that was having difficulty accessing is to provide an alternative form to which they could access. And, and that that could probably that would probably work or have an alternative method if survey monkey you know just does written um, have an alternative you need in the question is could I mean, could need access do you need I mean you could do that in your email that they read it to if you need a, a, a different access um, contact us and then give them a different access that way um, but yeah that's a good question Terrell. I <laughs> I don't know much about Survey Monkey, so I can't, you know, offer um, specifics on that. But that's helpful to know about Google Forms. Yeah. I didn't know that, and so in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, I have to write these questions, and then I have to do a recording of each of these questions, and then how do I attach it to the so that so that I didn't know Google Drive or Google Forms. Yeah, that. yeah, it was actually Microsoft um, oh, does okay. that, but Google. I mean, if you so, what I so how I created that pre-survey 
um, I was, I mean, it made it really kind of um, complex in terms, but I was playing around with Google Forms to see how you could do those multiple um, forms of communication um, in the form. And um, it does make it kind of lengthy when you can do that, but it, it does have, you, you can work around with Google Forms and Google actually has their accessibility um, turned on. And um, and then the, if you notice in getting started in the e-workbook, I show how to access from a user standpoint, how you can access accessibility within Google. So I, I'm really kind of, you know, I, I'm impressed. I mean, I think they have a ways to go, but I think Google has really come a long way in terms of um, how you as a, a creator and a designer can use the tools to make an accessible um, content. Perfect. Thank you. And then Allison in the chat typed in, I love the idea of the capstone activity. Yeah, pulling it all together. I mean, that that just captures a lot of different um, families, a lot of different um, users, uh, learners, um, in terms of being able to kind of articulate those ideas, put those puzzle pieces together. So it really captures um, a, a large um, audience of learners that learn in that way. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to go back to the menu again. And we're going to, now we know we have, you can type, go ahead and type in the chat which strategy you would like to explore next. Um, number one, if you wanted to do engagement. Number two, if you would like to explore representation. Okay, we got a couple twos. And I got a one. Anybody else have a preference? Oh, I, yeah, okay. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and go with two representation, and then we'll follow that up with engagement um, as our final um, strategy. Okay. Representation, we're talking about creating multiple means, and I do know this through the pre-survey that this was something that people were, were interested in exploring a little further. So um, how do you provide um, information in, in multiple, multiple modalities? And so this one here is a workshop in itself. <laughs> But I, what I tried to do is to give you a kind of a big picture, and you'll notice halfway down the screen that it's the digital document checklist. That is um, was one of those documents shared out with you, and I kind of tried to summarize some of the main concepts of that so that you had something that you could take with you today. So presenting the same information through different modalities, what do we mean by that? Well, it could be um, today. I'm giving a presentation. I'm, it's an auditory presentation. We do have a visual that we're working from, but um, it's also being recorded. It's gonna have closed caption. You can turn on closed caption so you can get that text-based if you need it. So um, not only do we have audit, uh, auditory, we also have um, visual and we also have text. So the more you can provide the same information through different modalities, um, the better um, that it's gonna be for the users or, or the larger users to be able to access that information. I also put in here what eBooks and learning modules, online learning modules, I probably should say. And the reason why I have put these in here is because I think when you talk about digital resources, you have given mo more opportunity to um, create a piece of instruction that allows you to deliver it in multiple formats. So out in the e-workbook, for example, we have accessibility. I have a link out there to a website with additional information, but we also have access to a video. And I highly encourage watching that TED Talk. <laughs> it's only 10 minutes long, but it really shows that link between accessibility and um, the and the accessibility and creating that learning environment or what is um, defined as universal design. So we've created this definition of accessibility. I, we've described it here in this presentation. I have provided written text in the um, e-workbook, um, but there's also a video out there. And if the user would prefer to fast speed audio through that workbook, they can do that. Or if they want to slow down or if they want to repeat. So there's you know a lot of ways to to present that same information in different modalities. And one of the easiest ways to do that is by creating those digital resources. With that said, 
our digital resources really need to be formatted for accessibility. And so it sounds like there's a, um, a few of you in the room today that have already um, engaged and, and create digital accessible um, resources, which is great. If you are just getting started, what I would suggest is that you start from, from this point forward, creating your documents that, so that they are accessible, digitally formatted. Um, for accessibility. Um, it's easier to proactively start creating accessible documents than it is to re um, retroactively go back and try to changing it. So starting this moment forward, going forward to do that. In a few minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and click on that link. Um, this is, as I mentioned, is in itself is a workshop, but I do wanna highlight some things that I think um, will get to what some of you were interested in. And also um, having those digital handouts in advance, if this is something, if you're doing this now, this is that that's great. Um, this, what this does is it provides that those um, families, those users who really need to create context around um, your presentation before coming, maybe they need to um, be able to access those in a different format prior to the to the your your webinar prior to your training so having those in advance and one of the things that you could do is sh set up a shared drive and um and open it to people that have access to the links and you can put those digital resources in there um, and then way they can access it. But what by sharing that file, you can also, if they have resources that that um, work well and they want to share, they can also put that in the folder. So having those handouts in advance, using the technology that you have with Google is a really a great way to um, um, make that information available. And the other thing is, is if you don't do this already, um, describe your images on the slide. And when I talk, what I mean by that is if you put an image, if you put a chart, if you put a graphic out there that is um, representing what you're, you're speaking to or representing what's in the document, please explain it. So if you remember when we went back to defining, going back to define accessibility, I described what was in those two images and how they were associated with um, um, accommodations and associated with accessibility. So that would be something that you could do because if you can think about it, maybe um, people are just listening and not seeing the um, what's on your screen. So now they have um, an idea or I could have just said, um, when I gave you those choices, oh, choose between one of the three options on the screen. Well, if someone is accessing the material in a different way, but and, um, explaining to them that representation is one or engagement is one, representation is two, they now have a little bit more direction on how they can engage with that, that content. So I'm going to click on this. This is going to kick us out and bring us into a Google Doc that you have available um, in your email. And I want to very quickly, because I'm going to watch my time here, <laughs> um, just kind of share some of those highlights. And if this is something that you're interested in um, and want a little bit inf more information about, you, you can let me know. But really, these are this does not entail everything that makes a document accessible. Uh, this is where I would start faculty out with um, in terms of what I thought would be the most um, easiest, simplest way to get their, their documents um, accessible. So we talked about the structure, creating tables of contents, using those formats, using those styles, starting with titles and headers, using bulleted lists. What you basically want to do with your documents is create a hierarchical um, reading format. And this is what those styles and use are, are going to do <clears throat> and using those bullets and using those um, those numbered list um, descriptive hyperlinks color um, and then having those um, alternative text um, elements. Um, I know that was really quick. The other thing to do here, and I want to do want to show you this, is that in Google, if you haven't done this already, go ahead and download a accessibility checker. Now, it's better to know about accessibility and what you need to do, but this is a really good, in case you missed an alternative text on a graphic, this is a really good checker. It's almost like Grammarly. Um, so you can, there are a couple, if there's one that I tried out called accessibility checker for docs. I don't want, I do not recommend that one because I'm telling you, if you want to feel really good about your document, 
documents, even if they're not accessible, this will give you 100%. What I would recommend, you can get a 30-day trial of um, Grackle Docs. And this one here is probably on the other end of the scale where it really critiques your document. And that's really where I like to be, is um, how, how to really down to the deep levels of how to make it accessible. But not only do these apps tell you what's wrong, but you can actually click on it to go to that and they'll tell you um, how you can correct and or make it make that document accessible. So that's really kind of a good checker um, is to download those accessibility checkers. Although I still, if you're not familiar with some of these guidelines in this web on this checklist, I, I strongly encourage you um, to become familiar on what, what those key concepts are. Okay, so now you have these really great formatted documents <laughs> and you have kind of a very a reading order to them. You know, they really make sense. Um, and it, it's a really, it's it, if there's a place that you can start with UDL, it's where I tell faculty to start because I think it's where you can have the most impact. But um, within those documents, I want you to think about this. We have an audience here today. We have people that um, have been using UDL in their training. We have people that are like, um, just getting started. This is just, I like this idea. How can I do more? And then people that it's really just a beginner kind of um, activity. So how do you provide instruction that engages all those, uh, all those learners? And so what you can do is um, go ahead and think about the um, new concepts to prior knowledge. If you remember, I know you know about accommodations. And I know you know about accessibility. So I link universal design to the concepts that you were familiar with. So the more you can do that with your families, connect those pieces, the better the understanding that um, and the building upon those prior knowledge. For those that may be not as familiar, have some vocabulary list. Um, you go out to the e-workbook. I have a couple areas where there are some key concepts, there's some definitions. So those that need a little bit more reinforcement on what that vocabulary is, they can go out and they can access those lists. Um, create a text sec outline. Um, one of the documents shared out was an outline of this presentation. Um, so that way people can take notes. Oh, I was gonna, I need to do this. Um, I can do this or some sort of graphical organizer to which um, um, either you add the information or you have them fill it out kind of as a progress check. So there's lots of ways to kind of integrate um, conceptually what you're talking about in your, in your presentation. And then I also say incorporate questions. You know, you can do this, um, you can use that polling app. We're going to demonstrate that here in a few minutes if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about. But um, you could ask questions, you could have prompts, and this is going to provide really a lot of information on where they're at and um, just opportunities to kind of access um, and their problem, prior knowledge. You can turn it into a game. There's a lot of apps out there. A lot of them are paid for. I was trying to find one to represent today. I just um, haven't didn't find a free one yet. But there's a lot that you can even create kind of a gaming kind of app and um, get guide your learners through um, the, the learning through that. And, and again, this is knowing your learners and knowing wh where they're at. And then if you are... Um, using the chat box and you are in a webinar, go ahead and repeat those questions being asked before replying, or if someone else can do that, and, and then also repeating those comments. So this is really, again, integrating, scaffolding that information um, from your presentation uh, into, the, um, into your presentation. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I, got distracted. My, I clicked the button and now my screen kind of flipped around. So sorry about that. <laughs> but um, let's go to that representation um, ideas. So what, what are your ideas? And I'm going to have to bring up the chat box again because um, it disappeared when I left the room. But there we go. So what are your um, ideas on how you could guide learners to content? Um, in various format supports. How do you do that currently? Or um, is there an idea today that you could take and, and use in your, in your presentation? So 
This is Angela in Idaho. I guess there are a couple of things that we currently are doing. Um, okay, just in looking. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, in a variety of formats. So some of what those are, um, we record our, our trainings. Mm -hmm. um, people can access them on demand on mm -hmm. our website after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, when people attend our trainings now, they get what we're using the, the Padlet yep. um, okay. option yeah. Yeah. rather than a Google Drive. We just send them to a, a Padlet link or they can use our QR code to access that. Mm -hmm. So everything we do, whether it's our slides or handouts or links or anything that we've talked about in the training is then accessible through the, the Padlet link. Um, and so I guess those are just a few ideas that are to where people can access things in a variety of formats. Oh, yeah, Th they're great ideas. Um, Padlet is um, really you can engage that, make that part of your, your presentation. Um, that's a, a great way to engage in a, in a different way, in a different format and providing those resources. Um, Padlet is known for its accessibility. Um, as an app. So that's great. That's good too. And I'm sorry, Angela, what was the first idea? <laughs> um, just the recording of our training so that they're access accessible on demand. After yes. the app. Um, yeah, it, just a, we also use rev.com. So all of our trainings that are, are recorded go to rev to get translated so that there are Spanish and English subtitles too. Yeah, that's great. So um, the um, recordings, what that even really allows um, your your families to do is if they need to repeat something, slow something down, speed it up. There's a, I mean, it's accessing it through multiple ways. Rev um, is is great. You know, you if you do, you don't have access to Rev, um, which sounds like you you as a organizations maybe you do, but you could also um, there's a translate in Google that is pretty good. <laughs> Um, so there, there, yeah, there are multiple ways to translate that information. That, you know, the great ideas on how to um, share out different representations um, for your for learners and to access it in a different way. Anybody else like to share? Angela, I want to pick your brain real quick. So I've seen Rev dot com being used i've never we've never utilized it so you do a recording through them and it automatically translate or how does i guess how does that work we send the recording so after we do our training we'll send that that um the recording over to rev and then they translate it and so they translate it the goal was to get everything in it, to get spanish subtitles but then they automatically do them in english as well they use real life humans and they're translating um, very well. That it is not just like mm -hmm. I mean, Google is. It, uh, yeah. yeah. Too many people have told me Google's not not only not good but borders on offensive. <laughs> so okay. so we won't do it. So um, Rev.com is real live people. I've never had a complaint. I've had nothing but good um, uh, comments on on using Rev for for that that tool they'll you they'll do it in other languages as well but those that's what we're paying for and it is a paid service i will tell you for about an hour training um an hour recording is usually about 175 to 200 dollars. okay so um a translation that's amazing right exactly and it's good translation right okay yeah. sorry well, can cool. i ask a follow-up on that as well do you feel like they generally do pretty well with like special education specific terms that maybe aren't a direct translation? So we haven't had anybody complain about it. It seems to, I mean, I know we all speak in a lot of jargon, mm -hmm. um, but so far this seems to, it seems to work pretty well. Um, again, better than, uh, and I have two bilingual staff and neither have said that it's been a problem. So I think they're doing as good of a job as, as they can, um, not knowing who's behind the scenes over there critiquing it and whether or not they've got that experience with the with the jargon, but so far so good. And we've been using Rev now um, for about, well, I know for at least a year, maybe right out a year. We said, when we got our telehealth grants, um, I guess maybe a year ago, maybe it has been two years, it's all a blur now, isn't it? So, but yeah, we've been using it for a, a little while and, and those are, they're great. Okay. 
Cool. And then my second question, Angelo, is do you use or um, create a different Padlet for each webinar that you do? So they're not all combined and all over the place. So you create an individual Padlet for each each webinar. Yes, Melissa in my in our office is uh, a little bit of a, a Padlet guru. She's sort of taken this on. And um, yes, every training that we do, especially when they're customized um, or we get updated information, we we create a new a new Padlet. Now we can adapt some of them. If we've done the same training over and over, we might just use that Padlet and then update it. But no, it's not one great big file that people are going. To. And uh, Allison, am I wrong about that? Yes or no? Do you know? No, I'm not wrong. She's shaking her head. So I, I think I'm right about it. Awesome. That's really cool. And you find that people in, like that platform better than just using Google Drive? Um, I'm just going to say she's nodding and I'm going to say yes. And I personally like it. I think Melissa described it in our office as sort of like a Pinterest for documents. Mm -hmm. There's there's there is visual representation right. for each of those links. It's not just like it looks like a big old document. Right. Yeah. OK, well, thank you. <laughs> Good information. Yeah, thank you, Angela, for sharing out those experiences with Padlet and also uh, Rev.com. Um, I think that's where the interaction between the you know the centers and what you're doing and how you're integrating it. So it's um really really great great to hear that. So our last piece was uh, engagement, and I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And um, what you can do for engagement and providing multiple ways to engage, one idea is to kind of use a choice board. And what we mean by this is you give your learners um, options to choose from. And this is also kind of known sometimes as a playlist. And so you might have nine um, different topics that you might want to do in your presentation and only know that you can get to four or five of them. But you would prepare a presentation for all nine, and you could you could then um, have your audience, as we did here, you could give them the choice um, to how they want to, to which topics they want to explore. And I found this really works really well in terms um, of your individual audience. The comp, each one is going to be slightly different, and so you can give them the uh, how they want to explore the information. Now, do you get to all nine con um, topics? No. <laughs> but you got to the four or five topics that were of most interest to, to your particular group. Um, also, you can provide um, the sequence, choices in how they um, engage in the sequence of a topic. So we had three topics today. The sequence did not matter and how we um, presented on those. And so you were given the choice to decide um, how you wanted to, how, it, how that looked like. And you also can give choices in um, participation. And this here could be, as we did today, you can um, choose to respond by audio, you can do text, um, you can do through visual. Um, so there are a lot of ideas on how you can um, get provide choices in those particip in participation. So the last one I would like to talk about is the, the choice of um, the level of challenge. And I think that this is, um, I want to speak to this from the standpoint of a training program, um, simply because I think it's where it can, um, it can apply in a webinar, it can apply in your individual trainings, but it works really extremely well in um, a training program. So the programs that I created um, at UCCS for faculty development all were tiered like this for different levels of challenge because I had had faculty coming in who knew very little <laughs> about UDL to faculty that have were using it and, and moving on and wanting to you know, apply it in different ways. So if you can think about how you can um, have material, training materials available, even if this is not all through a webinar um, that are at the beginning level or even at the intermediate and advanced, and then also how you can um, you could you uh, and when information made the most sense in those webinars. So what we would do at UCCS is we would have um, a um, learning management system that we would provide some basic information. And when we came together in our webinars, it was really about some of those intermediate and advanced kind of topics and articulating and taking those um, ideas um, beyond. But this was a whole badge system that we created, so faculty would earn badges at different levels. So it's a great way to integrate it and at a training program program. You can do this at a um, 
an, an individual training session as well. Um, and by providing those the e workbook, not only um, we have um, the, the information we're presenting to now, but there's also um, an opportunity for you to advance if you would like to, um, going to the e-workbook and accessing some of those resources, or if you're a beginner and you wanna learn a little bit more about some of those key um, vocabulary, that you can do that as well. So there's lots of, lots of ways to kind of integrate the, the different levels of challenge. Okay, so I'm gonna just pause there for just a second and, um, ask for you. We had Angela offered some really great ideas on representation. Um, are there ideas out there for engagement um, and how you can offer choice in topics, choice in how they engage, choice in um, the sequence? Or is there an idea that you can um, adopt from today's presentation? I'm trying not to overspeak and leave room for people, but if it's quiet, I'm going to speak. Um, so not for my project specifically, but we have another project here at this organization where um, they just finished with their first round of like curriculum and families, and they're going, these families are going to continue on for another year, and then they're, they're going to incorporate new families. So I think this is, I'm trying to figure out how that would work in this area to make sure that the new families are now getting that, that next level of engagement and by also still giving the first set of fam or the newer families like what they need to start on ground level. So I don't, I'm trying to figure out like how to, to work with this particular coworker to kind of incorporate this concept and say, how are you, how are you thinking about doing this? So. Hmm. Yeah, no, that, that is, um, that scaffold approach, that level approach would work really well because you have your incoming, um, incoming um, families, you have your families that are more advanced and you can create kind of this whole program based on this tiered approach. Um, and then if you know you, you, some of the other families wanna come back and revisit, they still can with those new families. So yeah, that, that um, matrix of choice um, is really, could be really powerful in that. Now that's a great application of um, that, that choice board. Sherelle, we have something similar in our SPDIG, in our um, Cultivating Readers project that we're working on. And it is similar in that the parents that are involved in year one, then they they stay in year two, but they serve as, they work as in mentorship. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's one way to create that engagement to know that the, the parents who were involved in the first year are now working towards more mentorship of families who are now starting in the second year. And then that just keeps on going in that direction. Is that similar to what you're doing? Um, not really. So it's personal network. So the families are creating like their circles of support. And so wow. they're just having their first network meetings. And so, so this is the end of the first year. So they, all of them just had their first network meeting. And so now they'll continue on to learn new concepts, but the new families that are coming in will kind of learn all over. So I don't know, because it's a whole family yeah. <laughs> working together, how, how that would work. Mm -hmm. I do like the idea of mentoring. Yeah. We have facilitators that like are helping through this process. And so um, they're kind of taking on the role as like mentor facilitator in that in that sense. So, yeah, hmm. yeah. Just re so some just really some good ideas on how you can apply these. And it sounds like there's a lot already going on and happening <laughs> out there in the in the different training programs. So that's really um really great to see in, in these areas. Any final comments before we move on? Because we have 30 minutes left and I want to get into an activity, but I want to talk about the process for a few minutes. So anybody else? Okay, so I'm gonna change gears here a little bit and I'm gonna go really quickly because I think that what's more important is to get into some discussion about how you could use um, UDL in your strategies in a, in a current training practice. But I am an instructional designer <laughs> by education and, uh, and professional. So I really feel that a pro the process that you use to integrate um, these strategies into your training is important. And so um, it's really about getting to know your learner, where they're at, 
what what their preferences are. I mean, I see, I see Angela, you know, is mentioning the translations for in Spanish. Um, she has identified that as, uh, you know, a need for in her learners. So there's, you know, a lot of things to think about in terms of how your, your learners access that information. And then really, what are your outcomes? Um, and really defining those in a very measurable terms. And how are you going to know that your learners have actually achieved those outcomes? And this is something we call instructional alignment. And these are all defined in, in the e-workbook. But really, I feel that this is really the start, the foundation before actually creating those inclusive experiences is having the, um, that information. So I'm not going to um, read through the slide because I know that <laughs> you, you deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. You, you're constantly thinking about this. And it sounds like, you know, the Idaho group has really, um, you know, engaged some really good ideas here today. So, um, but it's really being understanding your learner, knowing where they're at, what their needs are, um, and the and the variability in in that, and then how you um, represent information, but also how you how you take that into consideration for engagement and how they express express their their knowledge. But I want to share this slide here with you because I think it's really important. You know that there are three questions. I think yeah, instructional alignment really can be made by in three ways. Is um, what your participants um, should be able to do um, as a result of attending your session. These are going to be very specific measurable learning outcomes or learning objectives, depending on how you have your training structured. Um, and then what will let participants know that they can do that? And the final piece to this is what instructional um, activities and tools can support your learners in learning those um, outcomes and those objectives. And starting really with this as the foundation can really allow you to build upon that UDL experience. So when you start thinking about those materials that you're gonna to provide to support the learners, that you can figure, start thinking about the learner and what flexibility and choice they need, what support strategies they need, what enhancement, acceleration they might need. Um, engagement, you consider those strategies um, that are gonna help reduce um, any barriers, um, engage your learners, and um, really think about those strategies for learners to monitor their own, own learning. And then the final piece to that is that action and expression and finding opportunities for them to be, to be flexible in how they communicate and um, communicate and given choices and how they come to the conclusion of knowing what, what they know. To, they know. So... But what I'd like to do now is, because I think that really the important part of this presentation is to really um, and think about maybe um, a, one learning experience that you have. And so if you're in a, if you're thinking about a webinar that you give, is there one activity in that webinar that you could think about that you could enhance using UDL and kind of define what your learning outcomes are for that learning activity, why, why the learners um, are engaging in it, and then consider your learners and what some of the um, preferences are, um, some of the support, some of the acceleration that they may need. And then um, explain um, how you how you could integrate a UDL strategy to support those learners and your learning outcome. So this is the final piece um, to this presentation. But I want to offer you the choice. There are nine of us in the room. I offer you a choice on how you would like to engage in that. So we'll come back to the slide here in a few minutes. But this is also part of um, the e-workbook. It goes in much more detail. If you go to the table of contents, you can click on Apply UDL and then that can um, step you through the process as well um, after the session. But here, um, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and type in the chat the, the tiny URL as well. I just need to move it over here. So if you could use your phone to reply to the survey or... Um, and I'm typing it in, it's um, HTTP forward slash forward slash tinyurl.com um, forward slash YCYBKMMW. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat. You can click on that. Um, you have um, two, four options on how we can engage in this um, activity today. And I'm going to go also go out and 
okay, we have people over here. <laughs> Already I'm replying. This is great. Um, so there are four choices. Um, if you would like to do that in a group, if you would like to do that in one main room um, with a buddy or by yourself after the session, we have two that would prefer that. Okay, we have a tie. <laughs> like anybody else want to break that tie? <laughs> For those of you that um, are interested in doing it by yourself um, after the session, um, you can feel free to, you know, you can stay engaged in the conversation or if you feel that you got the information you need and want to leave, that's fine too. I'm going to type in... Um, to the chat, a the URL to that exit ticket. And if you want any follow up um, conversation with me, if you could, if you can go ahead and fill out that form, and um, I can contact you with additional information that you might have. But um, anyhow, the, let's go back and see where where we landed on that. We're still two and two. Um, so, um, anybody want to do a tiebreaker? <laughs> I think we're good with groups. I picked one in the one main room, but we can do groups. Okay. All right. So why don't we um, see who's left um, in terms of how many in, in the group? And I'm going to go back here. I do want to um, just cover really quickly this final slide for the for those that that may be um, that, that may be may be leaving um, that what are what kind of articulate some next steps. So um, all I, I would um, offer you is that, you know, start with one activity. I think I said this before, but don't try to change a whole training program, a whole webinar. Think about one activity which you could integrate some sort of a technology tool or, um, you know, a, a multiple means of some sort of representation um, engagement and engage your, and change it and see how it goes. You know, choose one learning objective. Consider the audience. I mean, you can ask your audience. You can give a survey. Um, um, for to to your learners to get an idea of um, where they're at and what maybe their preferences are, and then plan your UDL experience. And you know it may not go perfect the first time, and that's okay. Implement, evaluate, repeat. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 um it's it's a learning experience, a learning progress on, and it's gonna and that experience may be different um at each time that that you do that. So um, I'm gonna go back to the um, I guess first, what, what I would like to do is if there's any questions to go ahead and ask those, but um, I'm gonna see who's left. And then we're going to, we have, um, maybe we could do 10 minutes and then we can come back and quickly quickly report um, on, on what you learn. But when you're in the room for the 10 minutes, if you can think about a learning experience and kind of what, what you, how you could enhance it by using a UDL strategy and how maybe that addresses your learner and the, the learning outcome. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and I'm gonna go in and create. So we have still nine people in the room and I'm going to assume everyone would like to participate. So what maybe what we'll do Sherelle is maybe just do um trying to see where the breakout rooms are. Maybe two groups, if that works. Oh, there we are, breakout rooms. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do two. And um I'll just I'm just gonna go ahead and automatically assign you to two groups. And then I mean, there are other options that you can do for your own training, but I think just for the purpose of time, I'll go ahead and do, do that. And um, yeah, and so the, the idea here, once you go into those rooms, is just identify a learning experience um, that, and kind of um, how you could use a UDL experience, UDL strategy to enhance the experience for your learner, and that would also achieve your learning outcome. So any questions before? I create these rooms and <laughs> you're automatically assigned. Why don't we, it's 2.13. Why don't we come back at 2.23 and we'll kind of wrap it up and hear what the, how the two groups kind of integrated those strategies. And I will be in and out of the rooms if you do have questions and would like to ask um, those questions to me.
Sherelle. Okay. Oh, we did get her in there. Hi, Robin. Did you have any uh, questions? I'm going to go into the different breakout rooms, but um, if you had any questions, I'd be happy to answer those before I joined the rooms.
Okay, welcome back. <laughs> I uh, poked my head in on both and there was just a lot of engaging conversation happening. So I went ahead and didn't remove myself. I figured I'd be good to kind of keep that dialogue going. So um, anyhow, I, I um, is there a spokesperson for one of the two groups that would like to um, kind of give a recap to everyone on kind of the ideas that you have? Oh, you guys are shy. <laughs> I mean, our group talks about a little bit of everything, just kind of incorporating all the concepts and what does that look like? And we, we, um, you know, talked a little bit more with Allison about Padlet and kind of what that looks like. And we also talked about the concept of like finding the balance between incorporating more UDL, but also making sure that your webinar, if you're doing it in a webinar format, that it's not going extra long because the goal that people are trying to do right now is to make them shorter. And so um, how do you incorporate all the, the, the UDL training and accessibility, but also keeping to the, <laughs> to the shortness of a webinar to make sure that people, you don't lose people's attention. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the, some really, really um, good ideas. I was um, kind of in your room and I was no the exchange. And um, I think it's really um, the, the length of a webinar and the attention span of most people and trying to figure out how to um, keep that short <laughs> with key points, with um, maybe one concept per session <laughs> kind of thing, um, how you keep your recordings and keep it available, your Padlets on sharing those resources. So um, I think all those are just really great ideas on how to um, engage an, an audience with limited time and, you know, just um, limited attention span for your the different topics. Uh, is there a spokesperson for the other group? We talked about not putting people on the spot, but Carly, do you want me to put you on the spot? <laughs> I, I can talk, that's just fine. I was kind of holding back to see if you wanted to. No, 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 you go for it. Um, we talked in our group about doing pre-work and finding out ahead of time what the family's needs are, what they're wanting to learn from a session. And then also like, are they wanting something short and sweet? Are they wanting something longer and more in depth? and then kind of tailoring it to what they want. And we kind of felt like not only is that easier to um, make it more accessible to families, but also then they kind of have a buy-in ahead of time and are more committed. Yeah, no, I, I, the idea of surveying um, the user when you have that opportunity to do that is actually a really great way to really target the topics that you offer um, and in the format that your your learners um, would like and um, and gaining that attention. So yeah, that that's a really a, a great way to when you have that opportunity to do that is to you know get to know the learner, <laughs> kind of what they're at, what their expectations are. Um, you know, do they just want 20 minute webinars or do they want, um, oh, just give me a checklist because everyone is so different. You have the learners that want to engage in a story and they want to put concepts together and they, you know, they want to be really interactive and you have other um, families that are going to be like, just tell me what I want, I need to do. <laughs> And so how do you put that into a whole training package? And so, yeah, that, that conversation was, um, yeah, really um, fruitful. I kind of ca caught part, part of that um, to really starting with your learner and getting to know what some of their preferences are and even what their, you know, their technology skill level is and, and the ability to engage in that. So any other comments from any, any of the group members that, you'd like to add on or share or something today that really um, kind of stood out as something that was kind of useful in terms of going back to your, your training practices? It was all useful. We got some work to do. <laughs> there are things that we're doing really well and there's things, okay, here are things, areas that we could do a little bit more work for. I think we all kind of, each of us hopefully identified one of those areas to kind of go back and work on. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure getting to know you and, and um, the, some of the missions and some of your ideas on your, your training practices, your families. Um, the e-workbook is out there. There's a list of references that really dive deeper into um, what we talked about today. There's the e-workbook with um, the checklist that I've created that aren't as comprehensive as the one on cast, <laughs> for better or worse, depending kind of where, you, where you're at with that. Um, there's the exit survey. It's in the chat. They link to that. So, you know, feel free to um, access that. If you want to follow up on a conversation, I'm happy to follow up, up with you in that conversation as well. But thank you for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat>Well, Sharon, thank you. Yeah, thank you. They're, that's a great group. <laughs> I'm so disappointed we didn't have more. Oh, uh, no, I thought that that.